Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Is everyone ready? Um, okay, first I'd like to say good afternoon and thank you for attending. Also, thank you to our panelists for um, joining our fourth OpenStack Summit Media and Analyst Q&A. Um, for those of you who have not attended one of these in the past, I don't know how many of you have been to a Media Analyst panel at OpenStack before. Um, we've got an esteemed group here who are prolific. They write about the subject probably better than anybody, and several of our panelists have even been here from the beginning. So um, should be exciting and uh, interesting panel. Um, I also want to leave up an opportunity towards the end for you to ask questions. Um, so keep them and let us know, and we'll leave at least five minutes at the end to get that done. Um, so first let me introduce myself. My name is Kelly Andreary. I work with Piston Cloud Computing as their Director of Marketing. Um, and again, I would rather than doing it injustice, I'm going to have the panelists go ahead and take a minute to introduce themselves to you, and then we'll go ahead and get started with questions. So would you like your name? Okay, hi, my name is Rini Büst. Uh, I'm a senior analyst and cloud practice lead uh, from Chris Research uh, from Germany. And uh, yeah, for CRISP, um, OpenStack is a very hot topic, uh, especially in Germany. We did the first, or the very first OpenStack study based on this market. And if you're interested in, of course, you can uh, reach me out. My name is Frédéric Lardinois, and despite the fact that it sounds really French, I'm uh, German. But um, I write for TechCrunch. I cover a lot of the cloud, cloud infrastructure companies for us, and occasionally enterprise. I'm kind of the newbie here. Um, I only started covering OpenStack about half a year ago. So once we, we lost one of our enterprise writers and I had to jump in. So that's how I got here. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Al Sadowski. I'm a research director with 451 Research. Uh, we're one of the top four IT. Uh, research and advisory firms. I'm based in New York, and uh, this is my uh, fourth uh, OpenStack Summit. Hi, I'm Laurent Lachal from Ovum. As you can hear, I'm French, but I've been living in the UK for about 24 years. I'm hardly French any longer, I'm afraid. And um, within Ovum, I'm part of the, Ov um, the software team, and I cover cloud. I've been covering cloud for about four years, and OpenStack, obviously, is part of it. Bonjour, that's my French. Uh, I'm Sean Michael Kerner. Uh, I'm a senior editor at uh, Quinn Street Enterprise. Uh, I write for multiple publications there. Uh, shortlist is uh, eWeek, uh, Datamation, Linux Planet, uh, Linux Today, Enterprise Networking Planet, Server Watch, Enterprise Networking Planet, the list goes on and on, but those are the uh, big ones. Uh, first time I heard about OpenStack was when Chris Kemp called me uh, four years ago ahead of OSCON and told me he had something to talk about other than my theories on aliens living in Area 51. Thank you for the introductions. Um, so I wanted to start by talking about uh, the recent acquisitions in the market. There's been a ton of acquisition. There's been a lot of funding, um, which can send a little bit of a mixed signal, right, as to where the market's headed. Out of, uh, from your perspective, I'd like to know, um, you know, what do you think this means for the, not only the community, but for the vendors themselves, and more importantly, their customers? Um, and Sean, I thought I'd kick it off with you. Sure. Uh, there's a lot of money, uh, but the money is not necessarily directly attributable to the opportunity. I think the money is partially due to the economic, uh, macroeconomic uh, trends, the fact that money is cheap, right? Uh, there's no returns uh, in the general public market, so venture cap is big. So there's a lot of money there. So that's a, a one. In 2008, I think there was just as much opportunity, but no investment. So that's just a function. Uh, in terms of uh, risk to potential users, I think the risks are huge. Because when companies get acquired, uh, things tend to go bad. When companies run out of money, they tend to go bad. But that's the opportunity with OpenStack when it's really pure play open source as opposed to open core. Uh, the theory with open source, of course, is there's no vendor lock-in. Uh, reality is, of course, that plenty of open source solutions are not. They're actually open core, which means that even if you stick with one, uh, and you get locked out because your vendor goes out of business or gets acquired and gets shut down, you still may have a risk. So that's my short answer. Well, it's a f reflection of the maturation of the OpenStack market, this consolidation. It's as much about market opportunity for incumbents as it is about gaining the right skills because there's a lot of interest in OpenStack, but not that 
uh, m many people really um, understanding the uh, inner working of, of the technology. So that's what people um, um, acquire when they acquire a new company, not just the technology. In terms of uh, impact on users, I would say at this moment in time of the market, it's not that much because first there's not that many enterprise users and also what they do at the moment is uh, a lot of uh, proof of concepts rather than production. So for production is a bit more of a challenge. At the moment, a lot of people talk about portability between distro distributions, but uh, it's not really uh, uh, real. Um, but yeah, I think at the moment, uh, in, for productions, that may be a little bit of an issue, but for the market at large, um, less so. Okay, and I'll, I'll try to, uh, I agree with what the two gentlemen said. Obviously, the M&A and the investment uh, clearly shows some validation for OpenStack, but it also could cause some, uh, some, some troubles down the line. Uh, so instead of having all these small companies being a counterbalance to the big uh, vendors out there, when the likes of you know MetaCloud and Innovance and cloud scaling go away, and there are some big vendors that kind of control the agenda now, so it'll be interesting to see how it evolves and uh, and how the roadmap continues and how the uh, different projects uh, continue with some of the uh, larger companies kind of dominating now. So it's a good thing in general that there's M and A because people are interested, but it could be a, a double-edged sword at some point. So I, I come at this from a slightly different perspective, simply because the more M&A there is, the more funding there is, the more I have to write about. So it's, it's great, it's great for us, right? Um, we don't worry so much about the, the users who, we, we see a lot with startups, when startups get acquired, they get shut down, it, it's, it's bad for the user, obviously. And, but with OpenStack being open source, I wouldn't worry about quite as much. So from that, that it's just, as a writer, <laughs> we look at it very differently, so, um, but, are there worries? Yes, but I think the money, the money, as you said, the money's there right now. It's easy to get funding. It's easy to get funding in Silicon Valley, especially right now. So the hype is there. The hype around OpenStack is there. Containers, all that, you know, it's just, just working really well. If you want money right now for one of these products, it's there. Yeah, I think everything is said. Uh, I agree with with uh, the, the opinions here. And yeah, it's definitely it's a threat if the smaller companies are getting acquired uh, after a time or very early. For the users, definitely. But because when you're running a service, and we had much of them in, also in Germany, um, yeah, who knows? And uh, all of a sudden it says, yeah, okay, now our service is shut down in several months, and yeah, yeah get out of it, please. Uh, we are get, we are giving you the opportunity to get out of you, to get your data, but then you are on your own. And um, this happened with uh, more more the non open source based companies, but uh, of course when you are when it's about open stack or gen general open source technologies, it's much easier for the user in the end. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a pivot. Laurent, you've mentioned that there's a lack of enterprise adoption um, with OpenStack. I was curious, especially as an analyst speaking to customers or potential you know, vendors that are interested in using um, OpenStack or leveraging it, where do you see the market now? Who is using OpenStack and do you think the enterprise will eventually adopt? Absolutely. I mean, the fact that it's the enterprise adoption is not that large at the moment, it's absolutely fine. It's not a problem. Okay, it's not a criticism. Um, there's there's two waves of adoption. The first wave are people who are large and have the skill and capabilities to deal with the compl complexity of upstream uh, code. Uh, um, so you have uh, well public cloud providers, uh, Internap, Dreamhost. Uh, you have large. Um, uh, scientific bodies, I mean CERN is a good example of that. Um, uh, you have the IT industry in general, I mean the largest deal in OpenStack so far um, has been the deal that Ericsson did with uh, Mirantis, 30 million earlier on this year. Um, so, and, and this market uh, is still growing, so and uh, it's a good opportunity. And then there is this, what I would call the second wave of adoption, which is enterprise. And the second wave of adoption is driven by three things. First is driven by the efforts of the foundation uh, to uh, make OpenStack more usable, uh, more interoperable, 
um, uh, more consistent across the various projects. Um, it's driven by the efforts of um, large enterprise-centric vendors, the so-called incumbents. And again, we're talking about M&A as if it was a bad thing, but I'm sorry, uh, Red Hat and VMware and Oracle, and yes, they are incumbent. Yes, some of their um, OpenStack moves, some may be debatable in terms of the detail, but you know they have the mean to make uh, OpenStack a reality in the enterprise world. Um, and then also the efforts of public cloud vendors using OpenStack. Uh, and from that point of view, actually, at the moment, enterprise adoption is on the public cloud side. I mean, uh, Rackspace has plenty of small enterprises using OpenStack. They don't particularly care or know that they are using OpenStack, but that's what they are doing. Do the rest of you agree, or does someone have a different perspective they'd like to share? I'll just take the counterpoint just because uh, I would argue that uh, the reason why there may be slow adoption is because not everybody needs a cloud. <laughs> it's the simple truth. Uh, reality is plenty of enterprises are doing just fine with uh, basic virtualization. What's the difference between virtualization and the cloud? Uh, metered and service-based consumption. So for certain small, medium-sized enterprises, do they actually need service and metering? Uh, no. Uh, on the open source side, they can run you know, over to Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization or Zen Server or Zen or some other combination. But to actually... Uh, talk about enterprise adoption of OpenStack, I think the larger question is enterprise adoption of private cloud. Uh, that's the larger question, whether enterprises on the large, on the whole actually need private cloud or not. Some do, some don't, and that's where I see the adoption happening. But the question needs to be asked in some enterprises whether they actually need it. Uh, the only other thing I'd add in is that over time, I think the line between server virtualization and private cloud will blur entirely. Most uh, vendors that pitch me actually don't know the difference today anyway, but there is a, a fundamental uh, shift and a difference there. So at, at 451, we have a service called the InfoPro, and we talk to enterprises all the time, and we ask them specifically about where they're putting workloads uh, now and in the future. And two years from now, half the workloads in enterprise are still in a non-cloud environment. Um, public cloud is a very small piece. The growing uh, area is private cloud, and that's where uh, something like OpenStack fits. While it was originally conceived to be a, an alternative to AWS, it's increasingly seen as an alternative to uh, proprietary platforms used for, for private cloud, but the adoption rate for enterprises is small in comparison of the overall market, but you know clear, clearly growing, but the opportunity is in private cloud, so I, I agree with Sean on that. Maybe just from from the startup perspective, the, the the side of the business I see most of the time is I'm I'm seeing more and more companies, small startups who don't want to lock themselves into AWS and are looking for alternatives, and don't necessarily maybe even are thinking about running their own servers again. It seems like a switch from the last couple of years. So, I think there's an opportunity there as well outside of the enterprise for for something like OpenStack. Yeah, absolutely, and the question is if. Uh, enterprises should really care about then OpenStack or if they are just kicking, thinking about, okay, I want to have a private cloud or I want to have a managed private cloud and they actually maybe don't, uh, actually don't care about what's underneath. So if it's, if it's an OpenStack, if it's in VMware, it's in Microsoft, as long as the, the use cases are being, uh, being able to, uh, to, be, to be developed on this. So it's, uh, of course, OpenStack has is, is a very nice approach because it's open. But uh, when you're talking to some enterprise CIOs, they say, "Okay, yeah, we know OpenStack, we like OpenStack, but in the end, um, we don't care so much on the on the infrastructure level or on the management level." Yeah. So it's 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 really about which kind of uh, deployment model you you want first and then then to decide okay if this if the is, is the infrastructure layer we are talking about today really very important i don't want to say that OpenStack uh, has no meaning of course but uh, you also have to think about in in in, in this uh, in this circle wonderful thank you um so next question is a little bit different um but we often hear OpenStack referred to as the linux of cloud and i was curious if you think this is a helpful analog or if it's fundamentally flawed al why don't we start with you <laughs> okay um so they say go out on a limb because that's where the fruit is. Um, so a, a lot of people conveniently like to make the parallel with uh, Linux and OpenStack, but I actually uh, wonder if we're still in the Unix stage 
And as more and more companies uh, make more money and are looking at capitalism, we potentially see a vendor uh, drive off and create the Linux of OpenStack. And maybe we're still in, in the Unix stage. Uh, our market monitor service, we track the, the size of the market and um, it's a, a little under a billion dollars in 2014 and 1.7 in 2016. The, the biggest growth is in that distro area. Um, so it'll be interesting to see as the, uh, as the time ticks away if some of these larger providers uh, don't like what the, uh, the rest of the group has to say and kind of says, you know what, hey, we're gonna go it alone and perhaps that becomes the, uh, the, the Linux. So, you know, not everybody's saying that, um, but it's, uh, it's definitely a possibility. I don't know if anybody wants to totally disagree with that. Yeah, I think it's 100% true that uh, OpenStack is uh, the Linux of the cloud. And you can really see that um, that also the foundation or the OpenStack community has learned from how Linux has developed over years. So in the beginning, also, Linux was a very small project. Um, not a lot of people cared about. Everything was made out of the trunk, or you have to deal on your own. I can remember I, when I, my first Linux distribution was from SUSE, because I'm from Germany. <laughs> and uh, it was really it was really hard for me, because I also have to deal with the kernel and everything, and the graphic card doesn't work, and everything like this. And I think that it's it's good and to see that um, OpenStack is really professional. So you can also say OpenStack is a professional Linux of the cloud, because say, the, the, the foundation, the vendors who are involved in, in this community really know how to deal with it and to make it uh, professional and to um, and also yeah the the marketing around helps to uh, helps helps to to have a bigger adoption in a very short time frame when you're thinking about that OpenStack is only four years now uh, I think uh, we, we in, in, in the past we would not have uh, a Linux uh, summit in this size now here yeah I'll just give you both sides. Uh, I think uh, Linux is exactly the same as OpenStack, and then OpenStack is completely different than Linux, uh, and I'll explain. Um, you cannot run OpenStack anywhere else except for Linux, except for Solaris, and that's just a small kernel difference, but the new tool chain is exactly the same, uh, and then there's Dtrace, and maybe you can get Dtrace on Linux. You cannot run OpenStack on Windows, and there's a very good reason for it, because OpenStack is Linux. The core drivers that enable uh, Nova Compute, Swift, uh, Neutron are all Linux kernel space drivers. We're not even talking user space. Uh, then there's user space. So the two are the same. Uh, why they're completely different is Linux was born from a scratch uh, from Mr. Torvalds, who was sitting in Helsinki. Uh, OpenStack was born by vendors and then gets pushed down. It was two vendors, well, we'll call NASA a vendor, and Rackspace, it starts with the vendors and then it gets pushed down. So the adoption curve is completely different and it's much faster because of the vendors pushing down. Um, so it's, it's a little bit different, though now there are uh, some grassroots effort. You, you don't see any community OpenStack distribution today that isn't backed by a vendor. In Linux, it's exactly the other way around. There's vastly more community distributions and then there are the enterprises on top. So that's how they're different and, and the same. Renee? Uh, I just want to add something, and uh, this is also a Chris, a Chris opinion, is that we see that um, OpenStack is actually the is, or starting a new wave of open source technologies in the enterprise. Yeah? So Linux really made it into the enterprise, and now we have OpenStack who is coming, but also things like Docker, for example, which actually makes the yeah the 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 operating system like Windows, you know. So also uh, Microsoft is now um, developing um, an API so that you can use Dogger on the Windows infrastructure. So now we see a, a new wave coming into the enterprises, into the data centers like Mesos, like op like Dogger, yeah, and OpenStack is just the beginning. Docker needs C groups and namespaces, both of which are Linux native, which is why Microsoft couldn't just say, magically we support Docker, because it's not native. So they have to build those hooks in Windows Server, and then hopefully, theoretically, they'll get it. But it's also Linux first, because it's user space and kernel space. 
Yeah, um, I agree that yeah, it depends on Linux. I agree that there's it's a Unix from a distribution point of view. Um, for me, it's not that helpful on one hand and it's helpful on the other to compare the two. It's not that helpful because Linux is an operating system. An operating system is a well understood type of software. There are clear standards um, uh, and um, OpenStack is an infrastructure service platform. Uh, the concept of infrastructure service platform is not that clear. Um, um, there's no standards. Um, so the two are very, very different uh, uh, in terms of nature. Uh, it's helpful because it helps people understand OpenStack because there's a lot of people out there who don't make the difference between the upstream code, uh, community code, as well as commercial distribution code. And so comparing that with Linux and the Linux upstream code, the Fedora, uh, uh, open source communities and projects, and the Red Hat Linux uh, project helps people understand. Um, and in terms of, yes, uh, um, uh, in terms of maturity, I agree with you that the, the um, uh, OpenStack is dramatically um, uh, much more uh, more successful than, than Linux was uh, at the beginning. And that's a reflection um, of uh, the interest, not just in open source, but in infrastructure as a service. And uh, the, the two concerns of, of vendors, how to compete with Amazon Web Services and how to compete with VMware. So if, uh, I agree. For me, it's a good way of describing the project, I think, to, to an audience that's interested but not specialized. It's it's just a good way of getting a conversation started about it and to explain it just on those terms that people are familiar with because everybody knows how Linux works and Linux Foundation, and, you know, at least most people do. So it just helps to to describe it that way, I think. And then we can always discuss the, the nuances of it. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question I have is, um, you know, you mentioned where we are now is obviously Compared to where we were with Linux, you know, so many years ago, um, we've moved more quickly. There's more adoption, but I'm just curious. You know, it has only been four years. Um, do you think it's lived up to the hype? Where do we need to go from here? Um, you know, sort of what are you hearing that makes you kind of laugh and you know promises you're hearing or uh, supposedly things that are happening? Um, and what do you think is more exciting than you expected? Um, especially given um, those of you who've been writing and involved in this for you know since the beginning. Um, so maybe, you know, Sean or Al, you want to start with that one? And then I'd love to get the newer perspective from those of you who have just begun. Uh, yeah, early on there was no hype. The whole, all the hype was driven just because of uh, NASA's involvement. But it took actually uh, a year, two years, till it actually built the momentum. The early stage where um, uh, uh, Rackspace and NASA got on stage at OSCON in Portland was just, oh, this is something interesting. But I don't, there wasn't that early indication that it was going to grow into something so massive so quickly. I, I think that personally, that took me a little bit by surprise. Uh, first time I met Jonathan Price was about a year after uh, uh, the initial startup. And that's when I knew there was something more. Uh, his early target, uh, which was one, one of the earliest stories I wrote back in 2010, was uh, to be sort of like Apache, uh, you think Apache HTTP, uh, at one point before Nginx, that was like 90% of the web, just because everybody could use it, it's there. Uh, that's what I think the promise is, is on the private cloud side, is that it's just something that everybody uses until something else comes along. Yes, I was surprised by to by the by the the momentum that quickly built, and you know, good job that or uh, Rackspace. I think Rackspace did a good job, and I think that the foundation that took over from uh, Rackspace is also doing um, a rather good job at building that momentum. Um, the the problem I, I think in terms of you know, OpenStack is, I still have a lot of people who simply can't understand what the hell is OpenStack, because OpenStack is such a various things, so many things. First, it's it's a marvelously successful brand, and I think that's the, the, the core success of OpenStack is as a brand. It's got a huge mind share, not yet the market share, but from a mind share point of view, it's it's you know kudos. You know, you're you're a marketing person. I'm sure you you're you're jealous of of, of that that appeal that that the, the brand has. Um, 
as it's also a project, it's a community. As a project, is it's it's a variety of components. Each of them has its own story to tell, and and, and a complex story at that. Um, uh, it's an evolving uh, terminology as well. Um, we started with uh, core component, then you have now core components, uh, related components, incubated components, um, uh, uh, and then components waiting in the wing in Stackforge. And then the notion of core has now completely changed to uh, m moving from the core uh, technology components to uh, what, it what it means to be a core implementation. So the, the notion of core have, mo have moved from upstream code to downstream distribution. Um, um, and that's just the beginning. I can I could go on and on on what the hell is OpenStack and all the various facets. And so no wonder that people who just want to familiarize themselves with OpenStack have problem um, uh, because of all this. And oh, I, I forgot to mention, you have the technology components, the, the, the storage, the compute. You also have the support components, the documentation, the release, the, the, the management, and all that, which has which are not, which don't get enough uh, um, light, uh, uh, and and I think as as, as important for the uh, well-being and long-term momentum and success of OpenStack as the the, the, the technology components. So yeah, um, it's very complex, and I think to, um, that's the last thing I say. I think the vendors are not doing uh, a good enough job to explain to the market what it is. Uh, what OpenStack is. They are too busy uh, um, um, papering over the crack of OpenStack in order to, st to sell whatever they have to sell. Um, you know, Al, I want you to ask us that question, but you bring up marketing and, you know, the hype surrounding it. And um, do you think it's because certain vendors, um, I'm not going to say myself included, no, but um, we're kind of so in it and we're drinking the Kool-Aid and it's been four years. Do you think that's the reason that we've skipped past the education phase in a way? Um, because we feel like, well, who doesn't know it? And it? Does that make sense? And so maybe we need to kind of take a step back as a community. And I'm just curious from your perspective on, you know, Al, if you want to start and then, you know, and. It, it, it's clearly moved fast yeah. in, in four years, uh, you know, just the growth of the community and the in, in the uh, amount of investment. Um, but it's still, as many people w would agree, it's it's difficult to consume. And I kind of go back to like the, my oatmeal analogy in the uh, old days of oatmeal, your mom had that cardboard canister and you know she took some out and put it in the pot and if you didn't have enough water, it was too lumpy and it was a pain in the butt to clean the pot. And what OpenStack needs to get to is instant oatmeal where you rip off the uh, top, everything's in there, all, you know, all the ingredients are in there, you just add a little bit of water and, and you're good to go. And it needs to be the variety pack of uh, instant oatmeal. So if you want the big data version, you know, you rip open the pack and you make a, uh, that. If you need a, a private cloud for uh, um, web hosting, like it, it needs to uh, be that simple to consume in order for enterprise to uh, have wider adoption. <laughs> that's, that's a tough one, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. One moment. Do you have a question you want to ask or relate well, to I, the subject? Well, I just sat through a theater presentation actually from your company mm -hmm. where they were basically presenting instant oatmeal. Mm -hmm. um, the question I walked away with is, okay, but what do I get for $4,000 a year per server with instant oatmeal? Well, somebody be, somebody be, uh, should be able to explain that. <laughs> I'm not from the uh, from a vendor. I'm from the analyst community, and, and I agree that the that the vendors need to explain exactly. If you, if you walked away from a uh, a vendor panel and don't know that answer, perhaps they uh, you know didn't do a very good job explaining it. Um, but you know, there's there's different ways that people are consuming OpenStack. There's the uh, enterprises who think they have the resources and they'll go download the code for free and fight through it and and turn something up, and that's kind of the you know, old school oatmeal way. Um, there is the uh, the distros and the product providers, which is the the fast and grow fastest growing business model, who will sell you a, a a product, and you will still go and put that on your own uh, hardware and turn it up yourself. And that's kind of what the uh, you know uh, Red Hats and the Suses, the Canonicals, Marantis, and and Pistons, and and those will do for you, and you'll pay a a new annuity to do that. And then there's ones who will you know just offer you a, a service uh, 
you know, uh, whether it's MetaCloud or Rackspace or in, in Internap and the likes that do private blue box that do uh, private and public cloud. So it really depends on how you uh, want to consume it and how much uh, how much you want to take on yourself versus uh, versus outsourcing. Okay. Well, it just one thing in the you know interest of time, and I'd like to leave room for questions, and I'd be happy to answer your question as it relates to Piston after. Uh, this panel, but I love um, the gentleman on the end to also have an opportunity to respond to that question if interested. Um, so, I just wanted to pick up the the education part that that you mentioned earlier on. I, I do think that that has that, that was skipped because people have been so familiar with it in the community, but people outside of the community are just now learning about the project. Really, in the last year or two, just the last year, of really, for many many people, and. It's so complex, and then for me, trying to learn about it, I, I met with a lot of the executive team at, at OSCON this year for the first time, and it's really where I started picking up things. But then you start reading about it, and there's code names, and there's real names, and it's just, it's, <laughs> it's a really complex uh, project. It's not easy to, to sum up, and you, know, you, can, you, know, you can call it the Linux of cloud or something like that, but it's, there's a definite need for more education, I think. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, education is still important and, well, it depends on the the provider or the vendor if you need to educate on OpenStack. For example, if you're a Piston Cloud, if you are a Blue Box or a Rackspace also, the question is if you really need to educate the people because it's OpenStack, it's, it's, it's running, yeah? so you have a data center as a service or an OpenStack as a service, but they, the people only need to educate on how to use the APIs and not what this whole stack really is. This is a question you have to answer as a provider. Of course, when you are a distribution provider like a MyRentis um, or a Red Hat or a Zuzi, it makes sense to have a story around because the people are really using your distribution and they should know what they have on their infrastructure. And uh, yeah, I think this is, this is, these two questions are very important for the vendors. And uh, regarding the hype, I think the hype is over. Yeah, the people actually know what OpenStack is, so the important people you want to address. And uh, yeah, they see it uh, like an, a real option to yeah infrastructure solutions like from Microsoft or from VMware. And uh, you can really say that OpenStack, we always hear that open source is eating the software world. Well, uh, I think it's open OpenStack is eating the software license-based world. So. Companies like Microsoft or VMware really will struggle in the future. And we are talking to so many enterprises who say, okay, we are now on a VMware infrastructure and we don't uh, can handle this uh, subscription change anymore because it's getting expenses over the years and we really need to, um, to find um, an option to, for example, change to a KVM or a Xen hypervisor. Yeah. Sean, do you have a perspective? I know being on the ends of the panel, I can... <laughs> and then I know, Laurent, you Just do too. Just on the question of uh, what, you, what you get from the vendors. Uh, in open source, and I learned this uh, very early on, the first time I met uh, Bob Young in Toronto, who was the founder of Red Hat uh, years ago, uh, and, and, I, and he was just starting to sell the stuff and I was using it for free. I said, well, why would I pay you? And he told me, well, you're not paying for the bits. So when you consume any open source software, you are not paying for the software. If any vendor tells you that you are, they don't understand open source and just walk away. Uh, or they're open core and they're not really open source. What you're paying for is sometimes the glue. For example, if you had open stack and you wanted to download from trunk and build your own, which I tried to do once, I don't recommend it. It's a path to insanity and my sanity is questionable to begin with. Uh, so there's that, but you're paying for glue maybe. Uh, and uh, service and support, but in open source, the bits are open and free. Yes, agree. So that's what you get. You get integration, you get um, add-ons, uh, you get support, you get implementation services, you get a lot of stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that you can wrap around OpenStack. One thing I wanted to to add in terms of you know the, the nature of OpenStack is that it's still evolving. I mean, at the moment, what I see uh, in the market is a continuum between uh, companies that define OpenStack as an API layer on top of their own technology. That's the VMware and Oracle view of the world. That's one side. On the other side, you have people for whom OpenStack is both the API and the implementation of the services underneath. And it's the continuum. There's no right or wrong 
although there's a lot of debates in the right or wrong of that particular continuum, but there's no right or wrong. It's just about what is, what is relevant to a particular market. The IPI um, uh, uh, approach is relevant to a particular market, to more legacy, to more traditional companies. The implementation is more, op it's, it's, it's more relevant to a, a more startup, uh, open source minded um, a type of audience. Um, but, and at the moment, this, this, continu this continuum is being defined as the, the, the community talks about it and, uh, and as the Linux Foundation, I'm sorry, the OpenStack Foundation uh, works around this notion of dev core uh, because it's unclear at the moment whether this dev core uh, project will uh, stop the API, uh, whether and to what extent it will limit the API approach versus the implementation appro approach. And that's moment, that's the real key question, and it's an evolving question. There's no answer to that question. And it's okay that there's no answer. It simply means that uh, it's an open source project, it's built on consens consensus, and that consensus will take time to build. Great. Well, we're almost out of time. So, Renee, I know you had one thought, and then I'd like to open it up to the audience in the last couple of minutes just, we have to see if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you. Just a short, short addition. Um, the lack of, uh, yeah, we are talking about education, I guess. It's it's mostly not um, the, yeah, the requirements of the, or the, it's not, not the, um, not the vendors or the, the providers should take care about. It's more the, the ecosystem around. So when you're, for example, taking a look on the OpenStack marketplace, yeah, we, we don't see a lot of system integrators or, uh, yeah, or consultancies around. And it's, it's, maybe it's a part of the vendors and of the providers to educate first the ecosystem, the partner network, and that the partner network is running out, spreading out, and tell the story out there. Because in the end, they are the, these are the people the consultancies who are creating these massive infrastructure based on OpenStack, or on the in the enterprise infrastructure on prem, or in the data centers. Yeah. Great. Do we have any questions from the audience? I know we have a minute or two left. Do you want to step up to the microphone? Uh, thanks. Uh, very interesting discussion on the uh, education element of this in the comparison to Linux. Uh, I think one of the problems that the community has is that because of the rapid evolution of OpenStack, the business value messaging hasn't really caught up because you can talk about Linux and you can use that analogy, but I would argue that many line of executives in businesses wouldn't get what the value would be to them uh, as a line of business person. So I think we all are kind of jointly responsible for doing a I think a poor job of messaging the business value of OpenStack, and I just was curious as to the comments on that. Yeah, I can totally agree. Uh, our research study uh, on the OpenStack, okay, it was only in the German market, said that uh, we have asked for the pro and cons of OpenStack, and one of the cons was that there are not a lot of reference projects out there to see how you can use OpenStack in your infrastructure for your use cases. So yeah, it's. It's right. So we need more of these stories we hear, heard today um, at the keynote, uh, how Expedia does it, or how CERN does it. It's, it's really important, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, dis I disagree a little bit. I don't think it's up to OpenStack to educate necessarily, though they do. I think the way that OpenStack is adopted is users f up. So for example, CERN was not educated by OpenStack first. They had a problem. They look for a solution. They go, same with uh, the BMW keynote the other day. He had a trouble. His guys were coming, giving him reports, he goes, tries it. The challenge for line of business is simple. I have applications I need to deploy, I need to do dev test quickly. How do I do that? Figure out the answer. If OpenStack is the correct answer, that's the end of the, the conversation. As technologists, trust me, I love to talk about the technology. It's not the point. It's an enabler for business to be agile, deploy applications quickly at the lowest possible cost and the highest possible degree of efficiency. The the, uh, the number one reason we hear from enterprise as to why they're even considering it is cost. So they're looking to either um, take uh, workloads that are getting more expensive in AWS and doing it uh, in a private cloud environment or with another service provider, or they have a large embedded base of, of a proprietary platform and they're looking to do it without having to pay that uh, annuity license cost. But what the service providers and the distribution providers need to do is show that cost-benefit analysis, have a 
calculator that shows you, you know, if you're spending this much in AWS, we can save you X by moving it here or by uh, switching off of your proprietary platform to this distro instead, you can save Y. I, I, I think they'd need to articulate that a, a little better than they are. Just quickly, I know um, there's another session coming up and I'm sure we have a million questions. So um, if you gentlemen wouldn't mind, maybe we can go outside for a few minutes after and address some of the questions that maybe didn't get answered. Um, I want to have respect for the next session, um, which is starting pretty soon. So um, if for those of you, I apologize that we didn't have enough time, but it means lively conversation. So thank you for attending and thank you all for participating. And um, again, if you have additional questions that weren't addressed, please feel free to uh, meet them outside and speak with them. Thank you.